Canada. What's your team? Well, my team my whole life was the Montreal Expos, which is now defunct. Right. Uh, so now it's the Ottawa Senators. So you were uh, Marky Grissom, Andres Galarraga. That's right. That was very nice. People. Very well, nice. You need to Bill know. Gullickson, Scott Sanderson, right? All those. Guys. Randy Johnson. You're very good at this. Well, no, because you know where you are, Jamestown, New York, was affiliated with the Expos for 19 years. Huh. So all the people that you've mentioned and I've mentioned started here in Jamestown. So their very first year of professional baseball. Interesting. Yeah. Oh, well, that is good to know. So you're, you're I feel working. like I'm home. You are home. Okay, all right. And uh, we just, uh, a guy named Roger LaFrancois, uh, who was a manager here back in the 80s with Marky Grissom and, and mm -hmm. that, that group of guys, was just here at your seat, sitting in your seat just this last week. He now works for the uh, St. Louis Cardinals. So he's in town. Nice. So it's a flashback. Too. Okay, I feel good. Yeah, you should, yeah. Well, how, how do you feel about, here you are, Chautauqua, it's your first experience. What's the Chautauqua experience like for you? Oh, it's been magic. I mean, I think it's, everybody has tried to explain it, and no one's done it justice. So right. as soon as I said I was coming, I got just reams of emails from people trying to explain, you know, what, what to expect, and nobody even came close. And I think it's really been... Uh, you know, there are very few places in the world that really talk about tolerance and pluralism and trying to speak across boundaries and across disciplines that actually do it. You know, that's often a sort of self-congratulatory enterprise and it's code for, so come speak to my discipline. Uh, but this has been really an amazing cross-pollinization of ideas and people and speakers and everywhere you go, something is happening, you know, whether it's my six-year-old sat through an entire ballet. Uh, you know, we, we ha went to an amazing lecture about civil rights in Israel for women. Um, so you just have this feeling that there's this burbling effort to foster understanding and dialogue across, you know, and a community of people who want to understand, who want to be made to understand. And I just can't tell you, particularly at this moment in this country, where everybody is in a shoebox of their own ideas and won't listen and won't hear anything that right. doesn't completely comport with their life view. It's just like taking a bath of tolerance and listening. And it's, sign me up. <laughs> it's fantastic. Well, I think he just Great. And are, you, do you, are you going to plan on writing anything about your experience here, Stapa? I think I will. I think I might have to. Uh, I mean, I'm not sure what I'm going to write. I've been thinking about it. Um, but I do think I've been writing and thinking a lot for the past year and doing a lot of panels on civility. Um, and a, a big, big panel, the National Endowment for the Humanities gave a big grant to the ABA to think about these issues and lawyers and civility. Uh, and I did an event with them this spring. And it seems to me that this is an incredibly useful model for how to think about some of these issues in really concrete terms. You know, civility is, again, I think often code for everybody has to listen to me. Yeah. Uh, and why doesn't everybody respect me? And anybody who doesn't like what I say is suppressing my First Amendment rights to speech. That's where we're at right. in this country. And so I, I've been really looking at this week through this prism of everybody talks about civil discourse, but nobody can concretize it into how you would kind of on the ground implement conversations about things that are very hard and very, you know, riven and fraught, but are being undertaken with, I guess what I'm struck by is that everybody gives the benefit of the doubt, you know, the presumption isn't you're a liar and you're trying to destroy the country. The presumption seems to be everywhere I've turned, I may not agree with you, but help me understand. And so I've been, I mean, I can't tell you how bad my hate mails become in the past two years, just how angry this country is right now and how quickly we've come to a place, I think particularly, you know, in the media where we can't talk to each other anymore. So I, I've been really doubly impressed by that just in light of what I've been worried about and thinking about in my own career. Speaking of your career, this wasn't where you destined. <laughs> uh, by, the, by the way, just in this back, back story is, uh, was anybody in your family uh, lawyers? 
No, not that I know of. Yeah. I mean, I will tell you that to the extent that I think I have a, 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 a precursor in my family who did some of what I did, my great-great-grandfather was the chief rabbi of Baghdad in Iraq really? uh, for a time. And they um, did an enormous amount, as I understand it, of what we think of as lawyering today, and certainly judging today, uh, and dispute resolution. And uh, so I, I like to think, and I obviously never met him, I've only ever seen pictures, but I like to think if I have a relative who's up there saying, oh good, we're back to it, you know, <laughs> that, it's, that it's him. But no, that we're not, we're not um, lawyers, my family. So uh, when did you come into the States? I came for college. Okay. I graduated high school in Canada and then came to Yale on a sort of thought that, well, I'll go back to Canada after college, yeah. but that didn't quite happen that way. So from Yale, you go to Stanford? Yeah, I took two years in between and wrote a book. Uh -huh. um, I worked at Paul Newman Has a Camp uh, in Connecticut. Now there's seven camps, I think, around the world, but it was a camp that he built. Uh, with all the proceeds from the salad dressings and the right, tomato yeah. sauce and the lemonade uh, for terminally ill children. Right. So I worked at that camp for a bunch of summers cool. and wrote a book about it. Outstanding. Mm -hmm. Just a sidebar, um, E.L. E e Doctorow was here. It's a long story, but okay. I, I ended up uh, waiting at the Wensley House, which is the guest house at Chautauqua because they had all these writers, and I was asked to wait while a bunch of the writers went over, and I was just sort of the house guy. This was two years ago, and I didn't know who I was waiting for. I had no clue. All of a sudden, the car comes up, and out comes E.L. Dr. Roman nice. and his wife. I've got to think pretty quick here, because I'm, I'm going to work my way to have dinner with him. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm going to do this. So how do I do this? So how do I ingratiate myself with somebody who doesn't have a clue who I am? So I looked at his wife, and I said, uh, Mrs. Dr. I just wanted a story about your husband. And he's going, what? <laughs> Uh, my daughter and son both went to Kenyon College. And I got a VHS one day from Kenyon College, and their feature was E.L. Doctoral in front of the marquee that said Ragtime. Right. And he was talking about his days at Kenyon, and I was impressed. And I was equally impressed with the fact that he talked about how for four years in the drama department at Kenyon College, he tried desperately to get the lead in the play. <laughs> And he always came up second, and he did this great pregnant pause, and he said, yeah, lost every year to a guy, and he goes, his name was uh, Paul Newman. <laughs> and he looks at the camera, I wonder what ever happened to him. <laughs> so that immediately got right. him charged up, right. and got her charged up on a crazy story, and we spent the night. Next, day, next nice. day, everybody was coming to him, and I was, of course, the beneficiary of all these other people who were oh, hanging around. That's and funny. It was a great story. Had nothing to do with your story. No, no it's no, a good no. story, though. Uh, so you finally go to law school, Stanford, and now, now you become one of the preeminent writers in, in a variety of areas covering the Supreme Court. There's, there's got to be a, a switch. You did practice law for a little bit. Didn't you? I, I worked at a firm. I ended up going from Stanford. Um, I really didn't know what I wanted to do when I graduated law school. My, my story was very similar to many women who came to Stanford. There was a, a, a whole cohort of people, I shouldn't say women, largely women, who graduated in 89, 90, 91, and Marion Wright Edelman, head of the Children's Defense Fund, was their commencement speaker. And so then there was this slipstream behind her of all these young women who wanted to become children's advocates. Quite honestly, uh, you couldn't hear her talk about children and their rights uh, and not want to go to law school and be her. And so I was one of a number of people who went to law school and Stanford had at the time this amazing guy called Michael Wald who ran the Children's Advocacy Program. And all of us just like ducks following, you know, went to, to go to Stanford to do children's advocacy. And I was particularly interested because I had worked with these terminally ill children and had really experienced close hand um, what happens when you get cancer and your insurance poops out and the doctors can't see you and your education is not being, you know, that schools are not fulfilling their obligations. So I was really intrigued by what she was doing. So we all went to Stanford and then Clinton was elected that year and promptly Michael Wald was lifted, airlifted away <laughs> into the administration never to be seen again. And so there was just an enormous number of us, I think, who wanted to do, vaguely wanted to do something for children using the law, and we all kind of graduated at loose ends. 
Um, and I happened to be clerking in Reno, Nevada for then the chief judge of the Ninth Circuit, and I fell in love with Reno. It was fantastic, you know, Tahoe and the gambling, and it was great. So um, I stuck around and worked for two years at, are you ready for this, a divorce firm, mm -hmm. doing high-end uh, Reno divorces. And uh, that, that was something. Uh, that was, you know, I will lunch out for years on my divorce yeah. case stories. But uh, I just couldn't, uh, I continue to think that matrimonial law, and I have enormous regard for the people who do it, and I really met some of the finest people doing it, but it is not, in my view, the way to resolve family disputes. I mean, fighting over the pots and pans and the Tupperware and t-ball versus soccer is not, I think, appropriate for the courts and for lawyers to right. be doing that. So I left, and that's really, I mean, I think I often say had I done something closer to what I really wanted to do and loved it, I would probably still be lawyering today. It just happened that I did something that I found just deeply sad, and I had to get out. You started writing, and I realize you wrote a book, but uh, that was more of an experience. Now you get into a little bit of the law aspect of this. Was that difficult? Was that a tough transition? It was a crazy transition, and I really was just in the right place at the right time. I happened to be in Washington, D.C. Slate Magazine was about a year, maybe a year and a half old. Michael Lewis had been covering the Microsoft trial mm -hmm. for Slate, and he was wonderful. And then the break came, and after the break, he had something else to do. And so they were scrambling to find somebody to cover the second half of the trial. And quite literally, I was on the right futon of the right friend at the right moment. Uh, Slate called and said, you know, to, to my friend, will you cover the trial? She said, I, I'm at Williams and Connolly. I don't, I don't, I can't cover your trial, but I have this, you know, loafer on my futon who won't leave. So I talked to them and I said, you just need to understand. I don't understand antitrust. I never took the class. Uh, this trial baffles me. I don't understand what an operating system is and a server is. Uh, and I haven't been following the trial, but if you want me to come, sure. And they said, sure. So I covered the trial for them completely on spec. You know, I think they kept waiting for someone else to come along and keep covering it. And then when it was over, it was nice. I went home to my brother's basement in Ottawa, Canada, and about a week later, I got this nice call from my bosses at Slate saying, where did you go? We loved that. Come back and cover the court for us. And so it was um, just really being lucky. And also, I think, coming to the Supreme Court at exactly the moment where this very, very rarefied, dignified coverage of the court was a little bit ripe for reassessment and so to come in for an online magazine and be allowed to be a little bit more familiar and a little bit more jokey and to cover it in a slightly less reverent way so I think I was just in the right place for the right magazine at the right moment but it was a big shift certainly a big shift from legal writing you are you are young you were young obviously younger then <laughs> and you walk into the court and there's the Nina Totenberg's the Linda Greenhouse probably the James Kirkpatrick uh, old, old guard if you will uh, they probably don't want to be referred to that, but <laughs> nevertheless, well, how do they treat you? Uh, from the first day, people like Tony Morrow, uh, Linda, Nina, from the very first day were incredibly generous. I think that they felt that I was like a steam valve, you know, that could release a little bit of the stuff that we were all of us holding in. And, you know, I always joke that I used to come out of an oral argument and everybody would run to me and say, here's what you should say. Here's what you should write. You know, if you can write this, I can't. Uh, and that it was actually kind of nice for the press corps to have someone else be, you know, the enfant terrible in the room. So that, um, and I think, I do think that press coverage has loosened up a little bit at the court since then. But I, I, you know, I, I can't say enough about people like Linda took me under her wing from the first day. Tony, uh, you know, everybody's been, I think always very, very kind and very understanding of the fact that we were covering, covering the court in a pretty one-note fashion and that something had to give a little bit. Um, even the justices, and they haven't all said this to me, but in different ways, different justices have said over the years, it's good that someone is making the court a little bit familiar and even maybe a little bit silly because it's making the court human and I'm thinking Justice Breyer has said to me you know more often than not even though you make me seem like a goofy professor you know who, who is absent-minded to the point of you know near insanity I'm grateful that someone has opened up the court in a way and so I think 
um, just generally the institution knew it was too self-serious at every level and that I suspect they're grateful that I don't do much worse. What social settings do you find where they actually have contact with you? Um, I guess I've met, to the extent I've met justices, I've met them at, you know, they have various uh, things for the press. So they do have a, a, a party, like a, not a party, I don't want to call it that, but they have an event in the fall, they have an event in the spring. Um, when new justices come on the court, they, they have a sort of meet and greet with the press. But I, I think to the extent that I've met the justices, I've met them at judicial conferences um, when they're speaking or I'm speaking. And um, last year I gave a talk at the Tenth Circuit, and I was pretty brutal about the confirmation process. I know you've heard my take on it, but I, I'm not a big fan of, of what it's devolved to. And I said some things about how both Sotomayor and Kagan are far more interesting people than they let themselves be at their hearings and then look down and there was Justice Sotomayor in the front row and I thought, oh, uh, but she, you know, she came up afterwards and said, you're not wrong. But I think, um, I think that that, one of the things that's really hard about the current court is that they hear so little about themselves right. that's not filtered through layers of acolytes and so, um, if you believe, as I really do, that the mission of reporter is to discomfort the comfortable, <laughs> then you know we need to be doing a little bit more of that. I think. In the sequence, uh, obviously there is a uh, you, you're probably not now, but you were at the time a junior member. When you there's seating assignments. Do you have specific seats? We not only have specific seats, but my favorite story about the court seating because I think it says so much about the institution, is that on very big argument days, say on Heller or parents, the, the uh, affirmative action case, you're not only assigned a row, the rows go A, B, C, D, E, F, G, right? So on and so forth, but then numbers in the row. So A1 is the most important person. So that's, for instance, Linda or Nina, and then A2 is Tony and A3 is Marsha Coyle and down we go, uh, David Savage, right? And then the B's and then the C's and then to add to the indignity of getting a little card that tells you precisely your rank at the Supreme Court, they go further and they march you in on a line in that order. So that right before it's time for argument, they say, okay, A's line up against this wall, one to 10, and then B's line up behind them, and C, so there's C1 looking angrily at B10, how come he's a, and um, I liken it to my kindergartner where they march to the park on a rope, you know, and the good kids are little rope leaders and the bad kids are the, it's kind of like marching in on a rope to the court. Uh, and I, you know, I laugh because I feel like other than perhaps at the royal wedding this summer, there are very few institutions that so clearly let you know precisely where you rank in the world Isn't as the U.S. Hilarious. Supreme Court. Yeah. The, the clerk there, I'm trying to think his name is, is I want to Bill Marshall? No. Oh, Souter. Souter, Bill yeah. Souter, yeah, sorry. Yeah, Bill Souter. Anyways, yeah. great guy. And I've been involved with a few Supreme Court Historical Society events, and they kind of include me in a, on a, their annual dinner, in which you get to hobnob. And it was just, I was telling the story, because uh, I want to segue into the personalities of the court. Uh, when I go to that event, and they're all, all the justices are there, and they all, have, they all stand separately so you can kind of access to them. and. Everybody has two or three, and you sort of wait your turn, shake hands, hi, I'm from the Jackson Center, and that's all nice. Except for Thomas, of which you can't get to. Mm -hmm. Not because he doesn't want you to, but there's so damn many people hanging around him because mm -hmm. uh, he's a rock and tour. Mm -hmm. And uh, I always found that always incredibly amazing, eye-opening to a, a, a transactions lawyer in Jamestown, New York. Uh, but I know you talked about it, and well, let's, let's segue into, into the personalities, and let's talk about Clarence Thomas. Well, I think that the, you know, and I had this conversation 20 times after my speech the other day because there's this profound misconception about Thomas. I mean, one of really the great wrongs we have done in this country, and he hasn't helped, is to so deeply misunderstand his intellectual and uh, imaginative abilities when it comes to the law and the Constitution. So there's just this belief out there that I think was frozen in amber 
at his confirmation hearings that he's simply Scalia Jr. You know, he's he hires his old clerks. You know, he takes old Scalia's clerks. He doesn't write his own opinions. Uh, that he's given no thought to anything, and that couldn't be further from the truth, right? right? If you've read Thomas, uh, it's clear he has this fully articulated, deeply, deeply nuanced worldview. It's not one I think that most of us want to live in that country, uh, should it ever come to pass. But the idea that he and Scalia are sharing a brain could not be farther from the truth. So I think that's the first piece of it, is that there is no justice that we have written off as we have written off Tom's. And it's unfortunate because, agree or disagree with him, uh, he has a very, very, very complicated and I think very thorough uh, constitutional system that he has created. Now, layered over that, there is, and this is what you're alluding to, this public self that he has constructed so that you know, he hasn't asked a question in, I think it's eight years, I've lost track, maybe nine. Uh, you know, he's simply, not only that, you know, he uses oral argument to say, I just want to be completely clear, I hate you. Uh, an oral argument for him is an enterprise and staring up at the ceiling, often with his eyes closed, sometimes rifling through books, often giggling with Breyer. Um, but really making it very clear, not just that he's not asking questions, but he's not there. Uh, that he is there by force and he doesn't want to participate. Uh, and it puts to the lie a little bit, you know, his criticism of oral argument is, look, I don't talk because I want to hear counsel. He, he, the body language is not that of somebody who's listening intensely. But ask any clerk in the building, ask any secretary in the building who the most beloved, interesting, fun, gregarious person on the court is, and everyone will say Thomas. I mean, Ginsburg clerks will say Thomas. They don't agree with his politics, but he goes out of his way to know everyone's name. He goes out of his way to take all the clerks to lunch. He finds out about them. I have a friend whose wife was very ill. He came and sat by the bedside. I mean, he is such a different person in private than the one that he presents himself in public settings, and certainly than the person we met at his confirmation. And so, you know, query whether he should be kind of aligning those two selves. I, I think it's unfortunate that he has constructed a public and media self that is so angry. Because I don't think he's personally an angry man. But he's made this choice to completely disaggregate the Clarence Thomas on the bench from the Clarence Thomas he is in the rest of his life. And I think the other thing that's really interesting about Thomas and it's probably a metaphor for everything you need to know about Thomas, is that in the summers, the other justices go off, you know, and they go to Rome, and they go to, to, to Germany, and they give talks, and they give speeches, and they teach classes, and they use the time to travel and look outward at the world and to connect to the world. Thomas uses it, he gets into his, got a big converted bus, like a, a rock and roll band's converted <laughs> tour bus, and he drives to NASCAR races around the country. And he spends the summer, literally, you know, he jokes, parked in Walmart parking lots, being kind of with the people in that, you know, he's with the people, but not certainly being in his role as Clarence Thomas. But I think it says so much about him that when he's left to be himself, that's what he's happiest doing. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't feel either the obligation or the privilege of being a United States justice and ambassador to the world. He just wants to go to NASCAR and kind of be left alone. Scalia. So Scalia's really, you know, the best thing you can do is read Bis Joan Biskupic's amazing biography because it is completely clear by page 12 that Scalia at age eight was exactly who Scalia was going to be at age 68 and 78 and 80. I mean, he is a fully formed character by the time he's in middle school. Um, and I think he enjoys being the bad boy at the court. He certainly enjoys being the funny man. Um, I think he has adopted this persona of wronged crusader for, you know, um, conservatism for so long that he really believes it, even though he's prevailed now, and, you know, in so many different doctrinal ways, the world is as he would want it. Um, but I think, uh, and I mentioned this when we talked a little bit the other night, I think, I, I think what's interesting about Scalia is he really 
walks the walk and talks the talk. He is willing to go speak to any group. Uh, he doesn't surround himself with people who agree with him. He delights in talking to liberals and you know, ding, 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 taking them out like a shooting gallery. He and Justice Breyer do this dog and pony show where they go around the country and debate originalism. Uh, so I, I think that Scalia, for all the, the, the demeanor that can sometimes be curmudgeonly, delights in what he's doing. He says, and I think he's right about this, he was never writing to persuade anyone. Uh, he can't get to five. Yeah. And he can't get to five because he's writing to the law students. And I'm certainly one of a generation of law students who have come up just gobsmacked by his talent. Yeah. Breyer. Breyer is an interesting, I think an incredibly interesting character. You know, on the one hand, I think progressives are very frustrated with him. Uh, there's no problem too big that admin law can't fix it, you know, we'll just create some other government agency. So he's a big believer in uh, government and, and, and I think that makes some progressives nuts. What I find interesting about Breyer is, and I think I, we talked about this a little bit the other day, I think he's the only justice who's really thinking about the issues that the court should be thinking about, about new technology, about speech, about whether we need to reassess. Uh, whether incitement doctrine as practiced in the 1930s uh, applies till today. And I think he's really actively worried about those things. And I mentioned, and I think I'm not wrong to mention, I think he had two big I told you so moments this year. One was when he warned that the Quran burner in Florida was going to cause Americans to die in the Middle East, and he was right. One was when he wrote a very powerful dissent in the Schwarzenegger case, in the violent video games case, saying, you know, the court is not really looking hard and rigorously at the data that shows what these games are doing to the brains of young people. And then a few days ago, we have a, a shooter in Norway who clearly devoted you know, hundreds and hundreds of hours to shoot em up games. And so I, it isn't to say that Breyer's vindicated. I mean, I don't know the causation in either of those cases. And I don't necessarily agree with the proposition that we cabin First Amendment rights as a consequence. But I'm so grateful that there's someone on the court who's thinking forward right. rather than backward on these issues because the court continues to punt these questions to kick the can down the road and hope that things just get better and I think the time for that is over. Where's Kennedy fit in this continuum? Kennedy's fascinating. I mean Kennedy really is a court of one. Right. Uh, he is more than anything emblematic of the fact that the court that what used to be the right wing of the court is now the center of the court. So Kennedy and O'Connor, when I started covering the court, they were the country club, club Republicans, you know, the, the moderate right. Uh, now they're the center of a court where, which has pivoted so far, you know, with four justices so far to Kennedy's right. Uh, you know, this was an, another interesting term for him. I think he was in the majority in 94% of the cases. Two-thirds of those he voted with the conservative bloc, one-third with the liberal bloc. I mean, he's the guy time and time again. And people who are trying to think through these questions of where is Kennedy going to be on the ACA, on the health reform? Where is Kennedy going to be on DOMA? Where is he going to be on Arizona immigration, on gay marriage? Those things that are going to fracture 4-4. You're always trying, I think, to get into Kennedy's head and figure out which way the wind is blowing. And I, I thought that um, Noah Feldman had a really interesting piece this year after the California prisons case when they determined, the court determined, and Kennedy voted with the liberals, that they were in fact going to have to either release or relocate uh, tens and thousands of California prisoners because the prison conditions were so appalling. And Noah wrote a nice piece saying one thing to think about with Kennedy is that you will always get him with arguments about dignity. And I thought that was very wise. I think that if you look back at Romer, if you look back at Lawrence, at the cases where he has been most passionate and most surprising to people who like to call him a conservative, it's these issues of personal dignity and the idea of stigma and how uh, paralyzing those stigmas can be. Uh, so I said in my speech the other day, and I think it's true, if I were a betting woman, I might guess that Kennedy might come down on the side of gay marriage for those reasons. But I think it's really, you know, Kennedy is two things. He is a Supreme Court supremacist. There's no problem 
too small for the Supreme Court to wade in and solve it. Uh, and I think he's also really a believer in grand epic vision mm -hmm. of the court. Uh, and I think in that sense, he's not unlike Jackson. I mean, he's very aware of the optics of being the court and of the court resolving things. And so I think Kennedy, you know, it's folly to try to imagine what he's going to do in any one case. It's always fun to watch argument because everybody's, you know, not just only arguing to Kennedy, but if they could crawl up on his lap and stroke his hair <laughs> while the advocates are talking, they would. It's clearly he's the, the only guy in town. But I, I do think that Kennedy hasn't changed much, and he's not nearly as unpredictable as people like to think. Uh, there are just some issues that move him deeply, uh, and then issues like abortion, where he's just revolted, and he's not going to change on either of those things. Chief Justice. Uh, Chief Justice has a lot of Rehnquist in him, I think. Uh, you know, Chief Justice has split off from the conservative bloc now in a lot of notable ways, and I think I haven't made a, a, a comprehensive study of it, but I think the chief at the end of the day is very much a product of Rehnquist and maybe Jackson before, mm -hmm. uh, that the dignity of the court matters a lot to him. In other words, he's not kamikaze flaming, go down and, you know, like Scalia. It's always going to matter deeply mm -hmm. to him uh, how, how people think of the integrity of the court. Uh, I think that He's, he's a very, very able oral advocate. He probably was the best I ever saw as an advocate. And that sometimes it's been a tough transition for him to be on the other side of the bench. Sometimes uh, he's been a little sharp at oral argument because I think he expects counsel to be up to his standards. But I do feel like what I've seen is, as the court has tacked to the right, and I think the ends that he sought uh, are being achieved, he's pulled back a little bit. He's pulled back in tone uh, and pulled back, I think, to try to create a feeling that this court is not bitterly fractured. And so I think he's, you know, he's going to grow into this job. It's going to take a long time. He's got years and years. But I see in him uh, a real urgent sense that the court can't be what it appears to be to the world right now. And he's trying to correct for a lot of the real excesses that are happening at the polls of the court. And I think that's as it should be. I mean, that's what a chief does. Alito. Alito's fascinating. He, if you had asked me a year ago, I would have said, I think I might still say that the single best question at oral argument is always from Alito. He waits till right at the end and then asks the question that goes right to the heart of the case in a very, very deep way. Um, so I don't know that that's changed. What I have sensed in Alito is a, is a rising sense of frustration um, on some of these civility questions. So he was very, very angry during the Phelps case. He was very upset, uh, you know, as you can tell from his dissent, that the court didn't think there was a real mm -hmm. speech issue there. He was very angry about the violent video games case. He was very angry about the dog fighting case, and I sense in Alito a very strong, I think maybe I saw it at its height in the Christian Legal Society case last year and Doe v. Reed last year, cases about privacy and groups being able to define their own identities and not be assailed by critics. He very strongly identifies with those people at the center of those cases. So the Christian students at Christian Legal Society who wanted to keep gay students out of the club, his I, I want to say more than identification, almost over identification with them as victims as something. Uh, I think maps very strongly onto something that's going on uh, in his own role at the court and also based on his confirmation hearings, having felt really assailed. So I think Alito has become, I think he's really burdened by discourse in this country, by a, 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 a something that he sees as going really wrong, and he is very, very strongly coming out time and again on the side of the person who he thinks is the victim of the ugliness of the way we talk. And I, I, I'd say watch 
that I think that's going to be an interesting thing to watch. As I said the other day, I think that split between him and Scalia on these kinds of issues, mm -hmm. you know, Scalia loves nothing more than to be in the middle of a dogfight where people are hurling epithets at him. Uh, Alito thinks that is where America has gone off the rails, and I think that split is by far the most interesting psychological split at the court right now. Ginsburg. Uh, Ginsburg is, you know, I think Ginsburg has really come into her own in the last couple of years. I think she uh, feels very, very comfortable right where she is. She's the senior uh, liberal on the court now. That means she's got assignment power, which is nice. Um, you know, I think a lot of people expected her to be this fiery feminist lawyer, the one she was when she advocated at the court, and there's a feeling that she's so mild on the bench, and that's frustrating, but of course, she wasn't a fiery feminist advocate. She very, very passionately advocated, but always in the, in the demeanor of Ruth Ginsburg, and I think that um, she has just been this strong, steady voice for what she believes in, and I don't think that's changed. I think that she has taken it upon herself to be the voice for women at the court in the last few years, and that's why her Walmart dissent read like it did and why Ledbetter read like it did. Uh, I mentioned, and I think it's interesting, that she more than any other justice is using the media to talk about the court, and she very recently gave statements about how sh split the court is and about how broken the confirmation process is. So I think she's choosing to go outside the four corners of her opinions and try to urge Americans to feel as deeply about the integrity of the court that, as she does, and I think it's probably not an accident that she waited till she was 78 to do that. Kagan. Uh, Kagan's, Kagan's a pistol. I mean, she's really, I think a lot of folks were worried about Kagan, that she wasn't going to be a counterweight to the very, very uh, strong uh, conservative voices on the court. And I think she's proven otherwise in a very short time. I think she is a, an incredibly able writer. And everyone who has read a Kagan opinion or dissent this year is really aware of the gifts she's brought to the court. But I think more importantly, what Kagan has is this outward looking, uh, she, she gets people. And she understands that oral argument when she's losing a justice and that she has to make it her job to say, counsel, I think you didn't understand Justice Kennedy. I think he's worried about this counsel and maybe you could win the case if you could. She's very, very, um, I don't want to use the word empathy, but um, I think she's incredibly sensitive to social dynamics and I think that's Brennan, right? That's yeah. Bill Brennan and that's the quality that's been missing at the court and I think she may have it in spades and I think even though she's very young and quite liberal, I think it may, over time, have a real centrifugal pull uh, because she's got the intellectual firepower, but also I think the skills that she may be that Brennan character that's been missing at the court. Sotomayor. Sotomayor is different. Sotomayor has been described, I think, on some blog as the id to Kagan's superego. So she's much more willing to be the attack dog, much more willing to certainly, you know, talks a lot at argument, uh, has this very, very, very strong sense of injustice, particularly in the cr criminal procedure cases where she's written most passionately. Uh, so I think she's really taking years and years as a prosecutor, then years on the bench, and then suddenly now she has a real ability to change things. And she is, it's just interesting to see how much she, I talked about how Alito so strongly identifies with the victims in, in what he perceives as the victims in certain cases. She also, I have noticed, very strongly identifies with the criminal defendants who are not getting what she perceives to be due process. And so she's really been kind of come out fighting. Um, she, you know, having replaced Souter, who almost never spoke at argument, has upped the volume and the, you know, intensity of, of argument single-handed. But I think that she and Kagan have really forged an interesting partnership where, you know, Sotomayor will always ask the first question. Kagan will ask the incredibly highbrow, thinky question. Uh, and I think the two of them are working together in really interesting ways to complement each other. They're very different personalities, and I, I think they think very differently. It's just been interesting to see them become a team at the court very quickly. Robert Jackson. Jackson. 
Well, so a couple of things about Jackson. You and I talked a little bit about, you know, I've, I've done nothing but write about torture mm -hmm. for the last 10 years and attempting to answer for America's complete unwillingness to take responsibility for what it did. And, you know, I've been, I was an early advocate for a truth commission or for a special prosecutor or for something to t signal to the world that we take as seriously what Jackson did at Nuremberg when it's we ourselves who are the perpetrators. And so, I, you know, I always feel like I'm triangulating back to Nuremberg when we talk about horrific injustice being done people saying they were just following orders, people saying we were working under impossible conditions, people saying it was just the law and the law made it legal. Those are all things that I always map back onto Nuremberg. And I guess, you know, one thing I've thought about a lot as it's become very clear in the last two years, there will never be accountability for what we did wrong in the war on terror. There will never be a moment in which America takes responsibility for making bad choices. Uh, and, the, and the ethos, and this is, I, for this I blame the Obama administration, that, oh, you know, to, to stir all that up will just to create, be to create more politics and to, 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 to go through point by point who did what, you know, can't we just move on, right? That Obama's locution is just turn the page and get over it. And I guess I think that Robert Jackson would have been the last person who would turn the page and say, we'll just get over it. There can be no closure without resolving it. Um, you know, we always go back to Jackson, the concurrence in Youngstown, for these foundational ideas about executive power. I mean, how could one person get it so right, you know, and intuitively get it right in a way that would kind of continue to be what shapes the way we think about Guantanamo and renditions and everything else. Um, and I guess the last thing I would say about Jackson was something that I've been so aware of is that we have nine justices who went to two schools and all their clerks went to five schools and they all came up through the executive branch and then through the federal judiciary and not one of them, I mean I think there's only one on the current bench, that's Ginsburg who was any kind of civil rights lawyer, one. Uh, almost none who have tried cases. Uh, I think that the part of what is so impoverished at the court is experience, is having been in the world and tried cases and litigated like piddly little things that were too insignificant to matter to other people. Uh, and to marry that to Jackson's just incredible political savvy. Mm -hmm. And those two qualities, you know, I, I think O'Connor represented the last of real political savvy at the court. That's gone. Now, I think Kagan has some of it. We'll see. But certainly it's not from having a lot of political experience. If she has it, she intuits it. Um, but that being in the trenches, that quality of having lived life and been with people, I, I always tell the story because to me I think it speaks volumes of the Greyhound bus search case a few years ago at the court where they were trying to determine whether riders on a Greyhound bus had a reasonable expectation of privacy and the bags over their heads. And you're watching nine justices who have clearly never been on a Greyhound bus in their lives. If they've been on a Greyhound bus, it was 50 years ago. Uh, but if you had said to any of the nine of them, where's the Greyhound terminal in Washington, D.C.? I don't know that they could have found it. And it made me so aware of how much your life has lived inflects upon the way you do law. And I think that for me, Jackson really represents a life fully lived in a million different ways, uh, exposure to so many kinds of people. And I, it's not to in any way impugn the brilliance of the nine justices we have. No one doubts that they're brilliant. But I, I, I think we need justices who are out in the world and who tried cases <laughs> and who fought for civil liberties and who uh, really got dirty. Uh, because I think what's missing at the court, and I think one of the things Jackson brought to the court was that always having a sense of what was going on out in the world. Are you going to uh, write a book like Jeff Tubin, Nine Plus, or something like that? You know, I've, I've written many book proposals that I've never uh, sent to anyone other than my agent. It's hard to write about the court in some sense because 
um, there's only one book that's ever going to be written about the court, and that was The Brethren. Mm -hmm. And that was just because that was a moment where the justices wanted to dish about Chief Justice Berger. <laughs> They're willing to talk. You're never going to get the justices to talk like that. And I think, you know, I love Jeff's book and I love Jan Crawford Greenberg's book, but both of them reveal that even when the justices talk, they don't tell you that much. This is not a scoopy court right now. So I think if I write a book, it, it will be, it's going to have to find some other way in that isn't the brethren. Um, I have to say, giving my talk the other day, I thought maybe it's time to do a book about women in the court. I think it's an incredibly fertile thing that we haven't thought very much about. We haven't had time to think about. So maybe, maybe there's a book there. Um, but I think in the near term, I really do feel like I love my 1,200 word dispatches. I love what I'm doing, and I feel like I would do my job for free, don't tell my bosses. I would do my job for free, so I have the best job in the world. By the way, your presentation was just outstanding, but the telltale for me, because we've seen how Chautauqua works, and it's a very intriguing audience, smart audience, but what happens usually when the presentation ends, and just prior to the Q&A, there's a mass exodus, mm -hmm. and especially from the four o'clock platform, because five o'clock is dinner time. Right. <laughs> and I don't know if they ever clued you in about what normal, because it could be, I assume, disconcerting to a speaker. But to your point, and it was the talk of the post, uh, the post mortem was not only a great presentation, but nobody really left for the Q and A. That's nice. And that's that's amazing. That's in fact, nice. the president of Chautauqua, Tom Becker, said to me, "Because Greg, I heard I heard the most amazing thing happen, and she was that good." <laughs> that engaged and had the audience engaged to the point they did not leave. It was nice. I mean, again, you, nice. you may assume that's normal, but it ain't. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah, all, the, all those guys who predeceased you, we had to always tell them, and I'm not sure we, we kind of didn't. No, you nobody say, told me. Don't, don't be upset. <laughs> they leave. You could have um, Mozart playing. Right. And there's a time <laughs> Mozart could be the done of his first uh, of three uh, presentations and they'd be gone. You'd say, what? That's your stuff. So congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. What's the story, or what's the question you normally get that I, we really haven't gotten into today? Um, question I normally get that we haven't gotten today. Um, huh. I'm loving the bells right now. Sorry. Yeah, it's very uh, a question that I've gotten that we haven't gotten today. Um, oh, cameras, cameras in the court. Yeah, yeah. People usually ask about the future of. I know. I feel like you've heard me say, talk about this three times no, now. No, so no, okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, obviously, you, you don't think that's going to happen. Either. I don't think it's going to happen, and I think it's tragic. I mean, I really feel so deeply that the court is so worried about its public role and public image in the world, and they don't understand how great they are. You know, that what they do is breathtaking, and it wouldn't be like C-SPAN. It would be like watching the greatest trials in the world day after day, and that if they worry about their legitimacy, having cameras in there. I mean, yes, that people would make fun occasionally, but overwhelmingly, I think Americans would be struck by how well they do their jobs and how seriously they take right. it and how apolitical they are most of the time. And that the idea that we see the tryout, you know, we see the job interview, these ridiculous confirmation hearings, but not the job, right. is, is insane. And so I, I really feel like we need to get cameras in there. And I think that the justices need to stop giving partisan speeches. I think that they need to realize they live in a bubble now and live accordingly. And uh, I think those two things would do so much to up the esteem and prestige of the court. And those are easy fixes that the court's not willing to make. You're in a long line, and current long line, of speakers that you're talking about. Jeffrey Stone, Linda Greenhouse, Seth Waxman, Jeff Tubin, Paul Clement, Jeff Schessel, now Dahlia Lithwick. You've raised the bar as higher. 
And if you were to sit down with John and me and say, here's who you should consider next year or the next couple of years, who would you, who would you recommend? Easy, Sherilyn Eiffel. Do you know who she is? Mm -hmm. She's Gwen Eiffel's cousin, I believe. She's a professor at one of the DC universities. Um, she writes quite often. We, we get her to write for The Root, which is the black, it's Skip Gates's sort of uh, black current events site. Um, she's a court watcher. She's been a professor for, I want to say, 20 or 30 years. And she does ethics stuff, among other things. So I think her, her so for instance, uh, Chief Justice Roberts spoke at the Fourth Circuit three weeks ago and gave a speech in which he really made fun of academics and said the legal academy is utterly useless and that, you know, sure you can go there to hear about, you know, deconstructing the passive voice in 13th century, you know, and just really kind of Im implied that there was no value to what legal academics do. And she wrote a fantastic piece. I think it's in The Root. But I know that the Brennan Center picked it up and circulated, and I think ACS did too, saying here are 10 law review articles that came out this year that the justices might want to read, <laughs> done by these pointy-headed professors, but you know, showing that what they do is as real and as urgent. And I just think, I've been on panels with her. Every time I've been on a panel with her, I've just been, because she's brilliant and eloquent, and I think she knows the court as well as anyone. So she, she, I think she might be my, my top pick, but there's, um, you know, one of the nice, nice things about the court is I think that, you know, people stay on this beat for life. I mean, I'm the baby at 12 years. I'm like, you know, I'm never going to catch up to Lyle. I'm never going to catch up to Linda, to Nina, to, you know, um, all the folks who, who have been doing this forever and ever. And I feel like there's David Savage from the LA Times. I did an event with him last week. Uh, Erwin Chemerinsky, if you've not had him here, is prodigious. I mean, he, he's the dean at UC Irvine now. Uh, and he also is one of those people who just somehow synthesizes and digests everything about the court. Um, I saw him do, at the Tenth Circuit every year, he gets up and does a reprise of the year at the court. And it's hour, an hour and a half with no notes. Just, here's what happened in the term. Uh, and he, you know, he's an interesting character because he's very liberal on a lot of issues, but he, I, perhaps because he's the dean at Irvine, is able to get up and be completely yeah. apolitical. So he's another person I would think about. But yeah, this is, you can't go wrong with you know, Marsha Coyle, David Savage. A every one of those people can get up and knock it out of the park, I think. Well, you knocked it out of the oh, park. Well, and, thank I, you. and I seriously say that. It was wonderful. Thank I, I can't, you. can't thank you. I was just thrilled to have your family amongst us. Oh my God, they had the best time. They really. It's funny because I feel like by osmosis got smarter. You know, they watched a ballet, then they watched a symphony, then they went and heard the woman talking about women who want to pray at the Western Wall in Israel. And by the end of it, I felt like, oh my God, they're going to be able to do long division in our taxes just from four days <laughs> at Chautauqua. So thank you, really. Well, thank you. And thanks for coming to the Jackson Center. I'm glad we had a chance to, to, to share this with you. It was, this is fantastic.